are here, so we will uh, begin. Uh, oop, welcome, oop, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, welcome everybody to Vibrant Light Stained Glass Learn and Do. Uh, my name is Scott Brevda and I'm with the Museum at Eldred Street. Today we're going to be talking about stained glass, everything from its history to the connection with our museum and two ways that you're going to be able to make stained glass right in your home. Uh, remember, uh, as we go through questions, if you'd like to chat, there is the chat feature uh, at the bottom of the screen. So our museum, uh, the museum at Eldridge Street, was built in a, a historic synagogue built 132 years ago. Here's an image of its exterior. When I always look at that image, I always see all of the windows, the scale of the space. In many ways, that's what set our structure apart. For at the time this building was built in the 1880s, the Lower East Side and New York City was a very different place. In fact, the Lower East Side was the most crowded neighborhood, not just in New York or in the United States, but it was the most crowded area in the world. Tens and hundreds of thousands of people were crowded into very small areas. And their homes were equally as crowded. The words we use for homes at that time are tenement apartments. And though it's often and technically a similar word for uh, the apartments that we use today, there are still a few differences. I want to have everyone take a few moments and look at these two images of tenement apartments. What are you noticing about them? How are they different from homes you might see today? If you'd like, you can type your response in the chat bar so we can, sh so you can share them. So one of the things that uh, I've always noticed about these rooms is the fact that they're very small. You could have two or three rooms and see upwards of, uh, uh, 10 to 12 people in them. Uh, yes, I see that Francine has said uh, uh, one room. Uh, so you, you would have one room, maybe two, maybe three. It's pretty crowded. Another thing I notice is the windows. If you look at the image on the right, uh, the window in the back there goes to another room in the apartment. There really aren't any windows to the outside. And in the apartment on the left, if you look really closely, there's actually a brick wall just on the other side of that window. Doesn't let a lot of light or air in. That's what really makes the, muse the museum and its structure special. Ooh, next slide. Uh, this is the interior of our building. It was a massive space. It is a massive space. You can fit upwards of 700 people uh, in this room. And it's also full of light and full of air. Much of that light and air comes from the 67 stained glass windows that are on every wall and even the ceiling of our building. For those of you who may never have seen stained glass before, uh, here is an example. Uh, you, it's not like the windows in your own home. It's not one uh, big piece of glass. Instead, it's many separate pieces of stained glass held together by lead. In this example, you can see the black lead lines surrounding the light blue circle, excuse me, in the center, surrounded by white lines uh, throughout. There's also a reddish brown pink circle and a lighter blue circle uh, as well. Have you ever seen stained glass before? If you have, where were they? If you'd like, you can also type your answers down in the chat. Okay. Stained glass itself uh, dates act actually back 2,000 years. The earliest examples weren't windows. They were instead ornaments or tchotchkes you might put on your shelf, goblets, cups, and the like. It's only about 1,000 years ago we start to see stained glass used in windows frequently. We'd see them in uh, churches, in synagogues, and mosques, and royal palaces. And I see uh, Luna and Rose said they saw stained glass at the cloisters. Absolutely, that'd be a place you would see it. Uh, 
This example uh, in Iran is from a garden uh, in, in located in the uh, uh, in the in the Middle East. It's very typical of uh, stained glass you might see uh, in this period. Uh, it's using uh, patterns of shapes and lights to light to create new uh, new colors and really a piece of artwork. Stained glass in Europe was taking a slightly different path. Uh, stained glass in Europe was actually called in this period the poor man's Bible. The priests and bishops who had commissioned the stained glass were looking to help tell a story. For most of their parishioners couldn't read. In these windows, you'd see depictions of, uh, of images of the Bible, of scenes of the Bible, and of people. This window in particular from the 11th century is uh, in the Augsburg Cathedral in Germany. It's the oldest unbroken window of, uh, in stained glass window in Europe. And among the four figures you see here, uh, two of them are uh, Moses and King David. About 100 years ago, stained glass became even more wildly popular wasn't just limited to temples or synagogues or mosques or palaces. People were bringing them into their own homes. One of the men at the forefront of this popularity was a man named Louis Comfort Tiffany, whose image you can see on the left. His stained glass lamps, vases, and even windows were prized and were seen in many, many homes. The stained glass lamp you see on the top left there is his dragonfly pattern. It's one of his more popular. I personally love the magnolia and irises window, which is on the right-hand side. Uh, it hangs today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Today in New York, you can find many great examples of stained glass. I know someone uh, mentioned the cloisters just a few moments ago. Another great uh, site of stained glass is St. John the Divine in Morningside Heights. There are many, many windows. By far the largest and most grand is the rose window, which you can see on the right-hand side. Rose windows are a little different. Some people think of them as a rose uh, spreading out from the center, but I've always thought of them as a wheel where all of the various stained glass rotates around the center, almost like an axle. It's usually in circular form. Uh, that rose window you see uh, shows religious imagery, but not all the windows at St. John the Divine do. They also show sports, uh, various arts, act and other secular events, even famous periods and events from history. On the top left is this image of the Titanic. And on the bottom left-hand side is an image uh, from the windows showing the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And we're actually going to be celebrating that event in a couple of weeks on July 4th. New York is also home to some stained glass hiding in plain sight. At Grand Central Terminal, just above the front is the clock face you see in the image on the left. You can't really see much light coming through it, but that clock face was designed by Louis Tiffany himself. It's a Tiffany, a Tiffany piece. I didn't know that actually before I started making this presentation. It's, it's very cool what you learn about New York here. Likewise, on the right is an art installation in Brooklyn called Water Tower by Tom Prune. It's like the water towers we see on buildings all over New York, but rather than it being made of wood and used to hold water, it's made of stained glass and lights up at night, almost like a beacon in the New York City skyline. Of course, ultimately, my favorite stained glass can be found at the museum at Eldridge Street. As I've said, there are 60 one, there were 60 some windows in our building. And from this image, you can see that they're everywhere. There are stained glass windows just on the right side. You can see on the walls. There's stained glass window all the way at the end of the aisle there on the women's balcony, and even on the left hand side. But if you look at the top of your screen, just close to the top in the center, inside that blue dome, you also see a stained glass window on the ceiling. In fact, the only face of our building that doesn't have stained glass is the floor. That would be a little awkward. One other window to note, one of my personal favorites in the museum, is the windows on the left-hand side. Some people have described them as pizza windows, others as trivial pursuit 
windows because they look like the pieces. It's the blue and yellow alternating triangles. Me personally, I've always called them fallout windows because they look a lot like the fallout signs that still hang on the buildings in my neighborhood. We also have a rose window, and I, I want to take a moment to point that out as well. You can see it in the background of the sanctuary. It's on the western wall. We have as well a close-up shot, so you can see some details. Uh, just like at St. John the Divine, it almost looks like a wheel if you're looking at it from the side. And in fact, the way the structure is laid out, uh, each of the rosettes, which are the little uh, windows around the edge, almost look like they're on spokes attaching it to the very center window. There are uh, 12 of these rosettes around the window, one for each uh, tribe of Israel. It can be very symbolic. For the moment though, I, I wanna take a look at that symbolism. I wanna do a deep dive of this, of these stained glass windows. I want you to take a look at what you see. Here are five examples of stained glass from our museum, and I want you to take a minute to see what shapes or what things you're noticing, what you're, what you maybe the, that can be what you were expecting, or what you weren't expecting. Why don't we take a minute and put some of our responses in the chat box below? So one thing that uh, I've always noticed about the stained glass is that it has a lot, ooh, fewer, fewer pictures than I expected. <laughs> Liz says there's fewer pictures. Um, yeah, no, it, there's a lot of uh, stained glass in our museum, but a lot of it is uh, some of the same patterns. Uh, Vera, uh, Vera, Vera Anderson is saying much more, that, much more modern than I expected. Okay, getting a couple more. Questions coming in? Yeah, so the, what, what I've always, lots, lots of circles from Francis Dunkel. Uh, apologies, uh, by the way, if I'm getting uh, names wrong. Nathan says there's a, a Star of David, like I expected. Okay. Maybe we have a time, maybe a couple, just give, give it, leave it a little more time for a few more responses. Okay, yeah, so I, I agree with what a lot of been said. There are a lot of great answers there. So there are 67 stained glass windows. Well, when we talk about numbers, they can be very large or they can be very small. Uh, the window that's in the bottom center is actually in the main dome of the sanctuary. It's on the ceiling. The chain that's hanging from it, it almost looks like it goes to the top right-hand corner, is the uh, chain that's holding the main chandelier of the building. Uh, in terms of the circles that, Francis, that Francine mentioned, uh, there are circles have, uh, have significant meaning uh, and different meanings in Judaism. Some look at it as uh, look at things continuing uh, in uh, becoming perfect. Others are looking at it, it as a symbol of uh, completion or things renewing. Uh, and the Jewish star, of course, is a representative of the Jewish faith. Originally, the a sign representing King David. Uh, the circles, though, are also brought over in some ways from uh, the Islamic architecture we saw, and Islamic stained glass we saw earlier. The building, uh, our building, is built in a Moorish revival style, typical of what you'd see in North Africa and southern Spain during the Moorish period. It's a very popular style for grand synagogues in this period, and the geometric patterns are in some cases borrowed from some Islamic uh, buildings. Uh, the other thing I'd love to mention about this stained glass is the fact that it's filtered glass. Uh, the glass in this case is very uh, function, is functional and practical. It lets light in. And one, one of my favorite parts is that when, from when the sun rises in the east until when it sets in the west, it is always uh, lighting up the room in different colors and different combinations. 
but the stained glass being filtered glass while letting light in also keeps a lot of a lot of people from being or everybody really from being able to see outside that's going to keep their focus on the services so it both lets light in and keeps people centered there's a lot going on with our stained glass windows as glorious as they are right now they didn't always they weren't always like that in the 1920s and 1930s, the population of the Lower East Side began to decline. And so too did the congregation uh, at, the, at the museum, at the synagogue rather. Uh, as less and less people were there, the main uh, sanctuary became less and less used and it began to fall apart. The stained glass were no exception. This is an image of what it looked like about the 1980s after many years of damage. You can see that many of the windows aren't there anymore. In most cases, they had fallen in. In some cases, the glass pieces had broke, broken. In other cases, they were gone. It would take a long time to fix the windows. Uh, and you can see here the before and after. Uh, it involved finding all of the pieces, figuring out what pattern there were. Um, the uh, pieces then had to be, that were missing had to be recreated and put together. I actually want to show you a video of some of that process. So it looks like we may not have, oh, there we go. So old, when they're over 100 years old, the lead gets brittle and falls apart and gets weak, and so they get real dirty. Let's go back on this so we can see from the top. These windows are made with, uh, with glass, but it also has lead, and lead is, um, is the thing that holds them all together, right? It's the framing to keep, it, keep the glass all in, in one piece. When they're so old, when they're over 100 years old, the lead gets brittle and falls apart and gets weak, and so they get real dirty and a real mess. So what we have to do is get rid of that lead and put new lead in there. There was considerable damage in these windows. Uh, quite a number were either missing or over 50% damage. Of original glass that we are able to preserve, it has to be at least 75-80%. It just shows where all these pieces of glass are going to go eventually. And the glass is cleaned and rinsed and then placed on that rubbing. But all this glass will be put on the working drawing. That gives us our guide. The lead is considered the skeleton of the window that holds it all together. But the extrusion where the glass fits usually is pretty consistent and it sits the glass in this way and this way and here's your channel. A unique situation in this project is that there's a quite a number of styles, at least 10 different styles of glass jewels. And these are cast pieces of glass, uh, very special um, and unique in, in this type of window. Within each jewel, there may be four or five different colors of the same type of jewel. And we have to replicate at least, I believe it's 600 jewels. <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's quite a few that have to be done. When it's all completed, the sizes, of course, check to make sure it's going to fit into the opening. And then each joint is soldered. These all have been done. Like this is behind the Bima, the window 11. Yeah. These are all the balcony kites. These are the ears, so to speak, of the lower entrance windows. These are two are new. This is the old stuff. There's very few colors, and it's just the way the artist laid out the combination, the laying out of the colors that's incredible, that you can work with so few colors and come out with such different designs or different appearances, let's say. And uh, again, just real special windows. Okay. So there is uh, one window I have to mention because it's a little bit different than all of the others. On the eastern wall, in many cases, the most prominent location in the sanctuary, the original window was damaged and removed many years ago. About 10 years ago, we replaced uh, 
it with a something of a, a new window inspired by the historic design and scheme of the sanctuary itself. I want to give us a moment and take a look at this window and see how does it compare to some of the stained glass we have been looking uh, at today. Maybe how is it the same? How is it different? Give you a few moments to type that in the chat box. So Nellie Cooper's noticing that there are no lead lines. Absolutely. So this window was designed by Kiki Smith and architect Deborah Gaines. And one of the things they did is they, they didn't use lead in its construction. You do see the black lines coming out from the edge and going into the center, meeting at a, a Jewish star. But those are not lead. Those are uh, steel. And that's you'll be seeing a, another view of it in a few moments. That's what holds the window together. Uh, so um, Liz Rudd is saying it's like a modern design of the rose. It's like a modern version of the rose design. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of see it that way too, almost like spokes going in to meet at the center. It's very observant. I, I hadn't actually thought of that before. Okay. Um, so the window that you're seeing uh, is actually made up of 1,200 separate pieces of stained glass. It weighs in at over 6,000 pounds. It's very heavy. Uh, it was designed with the steel structure uh, and is different, I'm sorry, uh, Vera says different perspective shading is interesting. Yeah, uh, part of that is because of its construction. Uh, we do see the uh, stained glass on the left hand side being laid out. It was meticulously designed with different colors to play with the light. Then each section was put together and you can see just how large the window is on the photo on your right as the sections being laid in together. One of my favorite parts is imagining what we see in this window, what it represents to us. And I've gotten a whole host of different answers over uh, my years giving tours at the museum. Uh, some people have said it looks like the sun rising in the sky. Others says it looks like a galaxy. One sixth grader who I, gave an who I was giving a tour to said that uh, it looked uh, like a blender if you look at it from the top down as the blender spun around. He was very funny. In terms of uh, Nellie Cooper's observation that there are no lead lines, uh, the uh, Deborah Gaines and uh, 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 oh, and there's a question from Athena Hall. So if there's no lead lines, how are the glass pieces held together? Perfect question. Uh, if we look at the close-up of the window, we see that in between all of these different colors of glass are what almost appear to be clear lines or cracks between the glass. And that's actually liquid silicone. It's a man-made rubber. And that serves the function of the, uh, of the lead. It's what holds the pieces of glass together. Uh, there's actually in each section one main window uh, on the outside and then the glass is uh, glued to it with the silicone. Uh, Diane Hirsch notes that it looks like the moon and the stars is one. I, I love that, that comment. That, that's, that's really great. Okay, so we've now learned a little bit about stained glass, uh, about its history, about the stained glass at the museum at Eldridge Street and it's time for us to make some of our own. Uh, so I'm just gonna take a moment and stop the screen share so you're gonna see me again. Uh, and I'm going to get us prepped for our activities. Now, it's important to note that if, the, that we did send out a uh, list of supplies with the invitation, with the uh, confirmation. If you don't have the supplies, that's fine. There's no problem you can find the list of instructions on our website along with this video several days from now, and you can reconstruct it if you'd like. So our first activity is going to be uh, our vellum stained glass. Uh, and we start with this piece of vellum. I've already skipped the first step and printed on it. We'll get there in a moment. But this vellum paper is uh, trans translucent, uh, translucent. It allows light to come through it, but it's not quite clear. 
Uh, you're gonna you can take this uh, type of paper, or if you'd prefer printer paper, and look online and, and find one of our templates, uh, which these black lines are. We have four different templates from four different windows at our museum. You can print out the one you like, and when you do, I recommend that you don't uh, touch it immediately. Give it a few moments to dry. You're also going to look to see the side that it's printed on. If you're using the vellum, I would suggest that you turn the printed side down. Because what you're going to do next, you're going to take a marker. This is a, a Crayola marker that I have. You can also use a Sharpie, really any colored marker that you like. And you're going to start coloring in between the lines. And as you do, it'll begin to fill in. I would recommend that you start at the center. This is another template I've worked together. Uh, by starting from the center and working your way out, it'll help both keep your project neat and keep your hands from getting dirty. That's something we uh, always want to uh, achieve. Uh, towards the uh, end, you're going to get a lovely uh, finished piece that you'll be able to hang in your window. Based the, uh, with the piece of paper you use, when it's in the window, as the light hits it, the colors will glow, just like the stained glass at the museum. And a little bit later, I'm gonna have a photo of what this completed project looks like for you. If you do it on regular printer paper, you won't be able to use it the same way in the window, but you will be, have a piece of art that you'll be able to hang on your wall. I want to note one important thing about this uh, project is that the colors that you use absolutely don't matter. The colors that I used were my attempt to recreate the uh, colors of the stained glass in the museum. You can use whatever you want. If you want to make your windows pink and yellow and green, go for it. It's your project. The other fun part is that you can do as many windows in as many combinations as you like. For our second project, we're gonna make another kind of stained glass that you can do almost with materials you have in your own home. To do this project, you're gonna need some construction paper. I've found that light colors generally work best. You're gonna need, believe it or not, some baby oil and a Q-tip. You're gonna, I also suggest that you have some kind of surface that won't get dirty if you get oil on it particularly advise you not to do this on any furniture. You, you don't want it to get stained. Parents are not, do not get, are not happy when it gets stained. I've used a bowl here and I've already placed some of the oil in the bottom. You're gonna take your Q-tip and just dip it in some of the oil and then tap it off. Once you're done with that, just like a, someone with a quill might write, you're gonna draw on the paper with the oil. You wanna be careful when you're drawing. You don't want your lines to come too close and you don't want too much oil on the, on the paper. Because as you see, and it's, it's happening almost in slow motion here, the oil spreads. And I'm gonna do what I'm recommending you not do, which is put a lot of oil on the paper and you're gonna see what happens. Uh, you're gonna see that it begins to spread and as it does, if you have too much oil or if you have your lines together, your piece of art will turn into a big oil blob on your paper. We don't want that. Once you've given it a few moments to dry, you can take your piece of art and hold it up to a light source, whether it's a lamp or a, a window with the sun coming through it. And you can see that where the oil is on the paper will react differently than the paper itself. It will almost be like stained glass. Now the construction paper, depending on which kind you use, may fade if you leave it hanging in your window for too long. Uh, so that you may not want to do that, but you also might want to and give you the option of having a new uh, piece of art or the opportunity to make a new piece of art every day. Now I'm going to share the screen. I want to show you two more the two examples of what happens or what the end result of our projects will be. Um, this is the window I showed you earlier hanging, or the stained glass window hanging in my window in my apartment. You can see how it's glowing. 
And you can also see the yellow paper with the oil applied, how the oil is reacting differently with the light. So with that, we've spoken about stained glass. We've spoken a bit about its history, about its connection to the museum. Uh, I wanna open the floor uh, to any questions uh, you may have on, the, uh, on this project, on this history, or anything else. Oh, so I have a question. Oh, so, okay, so I have a question from, uh, I apologize, uh, Althina Hall. I hope I'm getting your name, pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. Uh, Althina asks, are the stars separate pieces of glass or are they part of the, uh, the piece they're on? Uh, I believe you're referring to the, um, the uh, window, the Kiki Smith and Deborah Gaines video. Uh, the, just getting my virtual background on. The uh, stars are separate pieces of glass that are fitted within the uh, other glass in the windows. They are separate pieces. Uh, all the different colors are separate. Oh, and Scott, so this is Rachel speaking. I also want to add, because Althea also asked a really good question about the stars in the Kiki Smith window, because those aren't made of glass. But on our website, we do have another really cool video that Scott just mentioned. Uh, you can actually see the whole process with Kiki Smith and Deborah Gans, how they made that window and installed it. Um, it was quite the production, including a, the involvement of a cherry picker to get yeah. the frame into our building. Cherry picker and a lot of scaffolding, absolutely. Yeah. And I also wanted to say, if people have questions and you want to ask your questions directly to Scott, um, just to use the raise your hand feature and I can unmute you and um, you'll appear on camera and Scott, you can ask Scott your question. Okay, so while we're waiting for questions, whether you're typing them or not, I, I want to challenge you if you're going to be making this project to see how many different uh, color combinations you can make with our windows. And what I'd really love to do, I haven't, uh, I haven't do, done this, but I might uh, in the next couple of weeks, is I want to try and do a bunch of different windows and put them like a, a quilt on my window and see what that would look like. Okay, so we're getting a couple questions. Uh, Vera Anderson is asking, I have a question. This was a great presentation and tutorial. I can see myself making this project with my grandchildren. I think that's great, Vera. Um, I think this is a, I think it's a really nice project to uh, do. It's, I, 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 I've enjoyed doing it myself. I had to make a, a lot of different examples uh, and I just had a lot of fun doing it myself. Uh, Fenette Pollock asks, did they use a different color palette in the re restored windows the original looks primar uh, primarily blue and the new one looks yellow, or is that my imagination? Uh, so Fenet, um, they attempted as much was as possible to uh, recreate the original colors uh, in the reproduction of the stained glass. The Kiki Smith window is the exception to that. That is very much more of a blue, but that's pulling off the paint scheme that is on the walls around it. Um, the experts, uh, in terms of the older stained glass window that was restored, the experts tell me that uh, there are subtle differences between the stained glass. It's never been something I can identify, so it's great that you're seeing it, because it, there, there are some subtle differences. Okay. So just give us one more moment to, uh, uh, if any questions come in, and I'm happy to answer them if they do. Uh, for the moment, though, I do want to thank you all for coming to this presentation. I encourage you to take a look on our website at the museum at Eldridge Street. We have a number of activities, including read-alongs, which my colleague Rachel uh, led. We had a program last week looking at uh, uh, the uh, uprising of the, uh, in 1909, looking at the strike, at the shirtwaist uh, factory strikes. Uh, and um, uh, that there are all of these programs and this one will be available to view on our website. 
just keep an eye on. We have a lot of uh, programs happening. We hope uh, that you uh, will be able to see them and we hope to see you as well at the museum. Uh, so Nellie Cooper says, thank you. It was great. Thank you very much, Nellie. Uh, and Vera asks, uh, will you be making any more presentations like this? So fun, educational, full of ideas. So, uh, so uh, we have a number of programs that will be coming out uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, days and weeks. Uh, we hope to have more. Uh, just keep an eye on our museum website. And if you like, you can sign up online for our email list and uh, you can uh, see what pro we'll uh, message you out about what programs we're having uh, in the future. Yeah, and um, I'll also add that we have a Facebook page too. So if you check our Facebook page, um, you can see all our upcoming events there as well. Um, and for anyone joining late, um, no worries. Um, this was recorded and we're gonna have this uploaded to our YouTube page by tomorrow at the latest. So you'll be able to come back uh, to this presentation. And, and that's also true for anyone who's doing the activities and just wants to refresh the instructions. So you're able to review it as many times as you like. And Scott, what I can do, we have because we have a few minutes, um, mm -hmm. I can give everyone permission to unmute themselves. So if anyone would like to maybe ask a question or just share a comment, I'm going to allow everyone. Just give me one moment, and you can should be you can unmute yourselves. Okay. All right. So if anyone would like to just ask Scott a question directly or unmute, you can. You just unmute yourself. Um, in terms of postcards, uh, we have um, uh, postcards available that show a lot of the stained glass, the eastern wall, the, the window, the western window, and well as some of the other windows as well. Uh, we do have those. Again, I'm not certain if they're available online, but I will certainly check into that. Uh, and um, uh, Liz, I will uh, see if I have an answer, I will contact uh, you directly on that. Uh, anyone else for questions? I'm happy to take them. I love questions, so please feel free. Okay, so I think we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you all for participating in the wonderful responses you gave. I hope you have uh, fun with these activities. I hope you've learned a bit about stained glass from the presentation, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And we'll, we all hope when we reopen that you'll come to Aldridge and Scott can give you a tour of all the amazing stained glass. So, um, so here's hoping for that. All right, guys, so we're gonna sign out now, but thank you all so much for coming. Bye. Bye, Lily and Rose. I see. I see you waving. Goodbye.